morning. We are so lucky to have Tama Watts here from San Diego with her book, her new book, beautiful book. Let's see if I can get it up there. Keep looking up your guide to the powerful healing of bird watching. So this is going to be a very interesting program. We'd like to thank the Friends of the Library who make these pro programs possible. We'd also like to thank Barrett Bookstore, our local independent bookstore who has this book on the shelves. You can type questions and answer questions into the Q&A field and we'll take them later. Now let me tell you a little bit about Tama. Tama Watts is a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified Kripala mindfulness outdoor guide, that sounds lovely, and an advocate for the equitable accessibility of nature, health, and mental health for all. She has served communities for over 35 years in managerial, clinical, and consulting roles for private nonprofit community colleges and public sectors. Keep looking up your guide to the power of healing Powerful Healing of Birdwatching is her first book that chronicles her journey toward healing by mindfully connecting with birds. As I said, she's joining us from San Diego, where it's only 77 degrees tonight. So all you Darianites will probably appreciate a little cooler air. We'll get I'll disappear and I'll be back later and enjoy the program. Okay. Thank you. And thank you everyone for being here. Thank you. So again, thank you, Darien Library, and thank you everyone who has joined and will join and will watch this at a later time. Welcome. Um, my name is Tamil Watts, and this presentation will be interactive, as well as I will do some reading from the book. So if you have it and would like to read along, I'll, I'll try to remember to point out the pages that I'm reading from um, as we go along through the presentation, discussion, if you will, um, the connections this evening. And again, questions, you can put them in the chat. And so I hope you'll, in, when the opportunity, when I ask you to offer a prompt, um, that you'll have a chance, that you'll feel comfortable to do so, to participate. Um, so just settle back. I hope you have your favorite beverage or drink and, and snack, and let's begin. So, and also I want to mention that I'm going as according to how the book was um, constructed as well. So we open with why birds, and I and I came with that because a lot of times people are wondering like what is it about birds? Why birds? And I'm going to read from that page, and I don't even know how you call it. It's before introduction, so it's the X I to X I I I. Um, so I'll begin. For centuries, we have belittled the bird and relegated it to a station in life of near unseen existence by many, in servitude to others and treated as pestilence. Yet these mighty beings who sport feathers and take flight, as did their ancestors, the dinosaurs, have remained in our lives, helping and nourishing our bodies and souls. Ironically, we have caged and studied birds to inform us about ourselves. And turning the page. Despite the change of seasons and unforeseen man-made and naturally occurring events, birds miraculously recall where they have been and where it is that they need to go in order to not just survive, but thrive from generation to generation. Nature is steadfast, true, and regenerative. In its cycles are opportunities to begin again, renewed, informed, and enlightened we also have the same opportunity. The pandemic caused most of us to pause and take notice, to slow down or completely stop. Nature and wildlife benefited. Nature benefited from the slowing of traffic, the silencing of saws, hammers, and engines, and the considerable clearing of the air as evidenced by satellite photos. Animals began to emerge from the borders of existence to flourish and frolic in empty streets and uncluttered passageways. Sea life came closer to shores and into waterways absent of motoring boats and nets. Miraculously, birds and their songs became prolific beacons around the world, pronouncing the will for us all to remain optimistic. Have you taken notice? This book is and isn't about birds. It's about life being curvy, twisty, and imperfectly perfect. It's about connection and joy, 
despair and healing. It's about you and me, along with all the rest of us throughout the world. And most certainly, yes, it is about the powerful healing that birds can have in your life as well. The practice of bird watching helped me with my struggles from years of debilitating pain following the surgical procedure and subsequent depression that had left me in a secret despair and feeling hopeless for a cure. In my darkest of hours, the connection I formed with the little yellow bird just outside my kitchen window splashed sunshine all over my soul. I rediscovered hope, love, support, and life beyond the confines of my four walls. At first glance, I'd say that it was a sheer accident that I discovered birds and their powerful connection. But as Louise Hay said, there are no accidents. My mother, Fran, who is most certainly aligned with her, says and believes the same. It is my hope that you will find fortification and resonance from the challenges, triumphs, therapeutic lessons, and strategies I share with you, and that you'll feel compelled to embrace our feathered friends that are all around. So that is why birds and what they have meant to me and through the journey, I hope that, like I just read, would will um, offer you some resonance, maybe something that's familiar for you or something to consider as we go along. So welcome. And I wanna first start with um, our nest, being at home and what the benefits of that can be. And part of that has to do with um, our personal stories. The book is constructed in a way that each chapter opens with a personal story, my personal story, because I wanted to normalize and destigmatize, depending on the topic or the subject, um, an aspect of life and living in order to allow for another process for healing and connection with the more than human world. There's also, it's a, it's a narrative memoir, transformational um, self-help guide. It has therapeutic, simple therapeutic exercises to deepen your understanding, your appreciation, and your practice. Um, and, and what stands out for me is Nora um, Thurston's famous quote, there is some, nothing greater than, there's no greater agony than, excuse me, there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story that's inside of you. And so I felt compelled to share the stories. And starting out with being at home, what I refer to as our nest, that is our, for most of us, a sense of comfort, of, of uh, a, a place that is most familiar to us. It may, all of our homes may look different, but it's still the place that we are at. Um, and so I really encourage folks to consider connecting right where you're at from inside looking out, as well as um, spending time outdoors, whether that's on a, a deck, a patio, um, a yard, a farm, whatever your space, you know, a high rise, whatever your space looks like. And my story begins with probably riddled with some fear. And you'll read that in chapter one. I tell the story of my story um, as a very young child, about five to seven years of age. Um, my mother, Fran, which you'll read about Fran off and on. And sometimes I refer to my mother as Fran and sometimes as mom or my mother. And it's not to be disrespectful, but Fran was a, it is, a, she's still with us at 91 years of age. She's a powerhouse and she was very much ahead of her time and very much her a, a person who was guided by her own thinking um, and very much in defiance by a lot of norms. And as such, she's very strong opinions and, and, and processes. And so at times I refer to my mother as Fran to really underscore and highlight that. So Fran decided that her kids, meaning my brother and I, should have a farm. And we lived in a rural area that was also part of the city. And ultimately, she purchased property across from a, a house that we had that had a lot of land. Um, it seemed to me as a child to have land. And it had a house that had a big old country kitchen. 
And so to her, a farm meant having chickens and goats and, and, and horses. And ultimately she opted out not, with, not to have the goats because um, someone had told her, oh, goats, that means um, they're gonna eat everything. And so she was, they'll eat the bumper right off your car. And she drove around in a little Beetle Volkswagen, 1960s Beetles Volkswagen. And so that frightened her. So we didn't get goats, but we had Timmy the horse and she got chickens. And the chickens were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John named in fact, after the disciples. Yes. And a fifth chicken named um, Rocky, whose true name was Judas. And was so named because he was often um, would attack the heads of anyone that would go on the property, with the exception of Fran, and that was myself included. And that's where I developed. To this day, I have a fear of birds flying too close to my head. It harkens back to my time as a child on that land with the chickens, caring for them along with all the other animals and growing the vegetables. Um, so I, when I reflect back, I think of that connection with birds. And as similarly during that same time, um, I also had a pet duck. I, my mother you know, allowed me to pick one animal and I selected a little duckling that I raised and would tuck its bill, it would tuck its bill under my arm because I carried it around so much to the point where my mother would just say, put the duck down, put the duck down. But I kind of treated it like a puppy. And I really, and you'll read that I found solace during a tumultuous time when my mother was going through life changes, mental health, health, various aspects of her life, I found solace on this farm, on this land with my little duck named Fluffy Duck. And so life happens and we continue to go forward in life. And I, as I aged and got older and I'm not young, um, I got very busy and I worked in mental health as an administrator for many, many years, working 60, 70, 80 hours and all the, all the th things that go with raising family, children and, 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 and being you know, in a family and um, relationships and all of that. And I kind of got disconnected from a deep connection with um, nature, being outdoors in this meaningful way or even noticing birds until I became ill um, injured following a surgery and be suddenly had to stop working. Suddenly that pace, I became almost like arrested in the fact that I could not be the way that I was. I physically became very debilitated and in fact, um, disabled. And the condition, which is a rare neurological condition called CRPS is the acronym, chronic regional pain syndrome, is one of the most severe pain conditions one can have and there really is no cure. And this revelation, and at the time there was, I was put through so much and willingly trying all kinds of medications to recover, but unsuccessful and was becoming more debilitated. And I think folks that have chronic pain and go through um, similar experiences can understand what I'm talking about. I became very housebound, couchbound. And so my world became very closed in and dark. I did not see the outside space. I did not see where I lived as a place of joy, a place to be. It was what I had lost. So I went through a lot of grief and loss at what I used to be able to do as well. And this can happen even in the midst of having family and having friends. It's the loss and not really understanding how to deal with it that can really take hold. And then one day I looked out of my kitchen window and saw this yellow flutter go by up in a tree that's outside um, outside my kitchen window we have a fountain and then there's a large tree that has yellow blossoms and i at first thought that that was the yellow blossoms moving but it was moving unusual unusually and ultimately i came down towards the water and it was this yellow bird now at the time i did not know what kind of bird this was and at that time i didn't have my camera ready um but we inst there was this instantaneous um this moment of connection with this little bird. And like I said in the book, it really did, I, sunshine shone all over my soul. It filled me with this sense of warmth and connection. And so every time I would go to the kitchen window, I would look up and look for this bird. And oftentimes during that season, which was spring, 
I would see this male yellow warbler. I came to learn what that bird was um, by getting a guidebook and noticing, and it helped to be kind of the gateway bird for me to see my backyard as the space and place that had other residents, the doves, the crows, the woodpeckers, and whatever might be passing through. I began to notice the house finches, everyone, you know, the forever present house finches and their squabbles and their families. And I began to notice the seasons. And really it's like the yard took on life for me. It took on color again. And I began to feel connected and bit by bit, I spent more time outdoors. And we're talking minutes at a time, building up my stamina because at one point I couldn't even hold a pen or pencil. Um, I was just very weakened. And this little bird was the bird that carried me through. And so similarly, I shared in the book, the benefits of birding at home. It is because it's familiar to you. This is a great, if you're, if, you're from not, if you're new to birding or wondering about how to get started or what, 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 why does this matter? As I said, the familiarity of your surroundings really offers you a great foundation and a place to start and also a place to, that you can come back to time and time again without having to go very far at all. And that connection can extend beyond into your neighborhood and local communities. Okay, so here's my question for you. Here's where I, I wanna invite you to enter into the chat, please, 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 please. What is your earliest memory of a bird? This is one of the questions you might have noticed there's the, the prompts and exercises in the book. Um, this is one of them. You heard mine, which is the chickens and fluffy duck. So I'd like to know your story. What is your earliest memory of a bird? So Johnson shared, feeding a chickadee from my hand out of our window, similarly feeding white swans from our dock. Wonderful. And Kimberly said, like you, I live on a farm and had responsibility to feed water and gather eggs from 18 chickens. I was four years old. Wonderful. And for some, the earliest memory might be just a, you know, a Maybe it wasn't in childhood. Maybe it was as an as a older adult or depending on your age now. And think about that. What are your earliest connections and who with does that connection um, draw your memory back to? It, there can, there's usually a lot of richness connected to birds with others in our lives. Oh, and Lisa, one more. Lisa said, on vacation in Florida, I slept in a top bunk where there was a nest out the window. We were there long enough for me to see the eggs hatch. I was six. Wonderful. And Debbie said, not just one bird, but hearing the bird's songs echo in the woods in early spring. My first experiences are connecting me to my mom who loved birds. Wonderful, wonderful. And then there's the power of flock. And you'll notice in the book, I each chapter has a theme that's reflected both this discussion in the book, I, I address the, the aspects um, and the dynamics that are shown through birds and the connection that can have to get, offer us guidance as humans, if you will. Um, and similarly, the benefit of flock, there's been research that supports that spending time in community, the increased engagement in those with whom you share, have some have aspects of who you are and what you value in common, as well as what you might have that are differences is what helps to enrich our lives and increase your sense of belonging, which ultimately helps in terms of your sense of well-being, wellness. Similarly for birds, there can be a, in a flock of birds, a flock of birds could be a birds of one species, or it could be birds that have a, a, um, different species, some that forage and, and keep watch up in trees, 
while others feed on the ground. And so they're sharing the space, they're sharing the resources, and their collective numbers is what provides protection for them. Just as one example of the symbolism of flock and how we as humans can take that guidance for ourselves. And that's what I share here. And what I also extend in terms of my story was I, after quite some time of birding, at bird, birding or bird watching, depending on how you want to say it, we use birding as a more inclusive term because you can bird, by the way, without seeing. You can bird by sound or just sensing birds around you. And so we want to consider all capacities. Um, so spending time with others, I decided finally I wanted to learn more about birds, and so I joined the, uh, my local Audubon chapter here. I'm in I'm in Southern California, San Diego, California, uh, and that expanded my flock. And so one of the questions I ask in the um, book is, what are your flocks? Who are your flocks? And this page here is just to share with you some of the outdoor based type of various organizations that offer considerations for you, whether it's by identity, capacity, ethnic, cultural orientations, interests, there's a lot for everyone. And soaring. Think of the birds that you see that soar. What have you noticed? They're usually grand in terms of their wingspan. And it is true, just as birds use their terrain to be buoyed skyward, buoyed skyward, we equally face our own seemingly insurmountable valleys and mountains and soar. And that's what I wanted to share. This, this chapter on mindfulness meditation came about because of during the time that time I was caring for my mother in her in her apartment so that she would have the familiarity based on her medical needs. Um, and and, and I, I share this because I know that I am one of many, 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 my mother has Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And so as we're caring for our loved ones and whatever that need may be, we, how do we restore ourselves as a caregiver? How do you draw upon who you are and what you can do to offer the best for your loved one in, in the way that you are able to show up. And for me, it was through me connecting with a little hummingbird that showed up on her, her balcony one day and just sat there. And it, it seemed like it came at a time when I so desperately needed that guidance. And I just sat with the bird and let the hummingbird guide me again in terms of really being in the present moment and that's what mindfulness is it's about being in the in the present moment not worrying about what you're going to do what hasn't happened yet and not fretting about what has already passed that's those are the seeds for anxiety and that's what the practice and maybe you've heard about this about mindful birding about being mindful being in the present taking notice of what's right around you um, and so a lot of times people can wonder, like, well, how do you do that with birds? Well, birds can be the your guide, if you will, the vehicle by which you do that. By noticing the birds, the feathers, the colors, that's how you remain in the present moment. And so I just want to offer you just one minute to practice so that you can see it doesn't take long um, to do this. And so I'm just going to invite you just for, again, this is one minute, just to, if you feel comfortable to either soften your gaze or to close your eyes. And just imagine a bird, envision rather, a bird that you have seen today. Where was it? Notice the feathers, what color were the feathers of the bird? And where were you at the time? And just breathe as you normally do.
Can you recall any sounds that were around in the area where you saw the bird or noticed the bird? Is the bird in a tree, on a fence, on the ground, on a ledge, flying by? And then I'm gonna invite you to let that bird fly to leave your presence. And as it does so, offer it a bit of worry you may have or something that's on your mind to take a little bit with it. It may be a small bird or not, but its wings can take away just a little bit of a concern you may have or a threat you may have and lift yourself, yourself and your soul in the process. Let it take it with it on flight and bid it well and grant it and grant a gratitude for its presence in your mind. And just take a breath. And that's something that you can do anywhere you are at any time. It doesn't have to be for a long period. If you only have a minute or two, if you have half an hour, whatever can fit for you is fine and that's good enough. I hope that that offered you some peace of mind. And you'll notice in the book that there are the reflective um, prompts and exercises to deepen your connection with that chapter's theme for you. And, some, and this, is, this is offered so that you can return to it time and time again. I really took some time and with intention about how I worded these so that it would offer the reader the opportunity to return to this as, as often as they'd like. And so this quote, which is a Taoist quote, is really, um, it, 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 I had a lot of resonance with it, which is, we cannot see our reflection in running water. It is only in still water that we can see. And I invite you in the book to imagine you are a crane standing at water's edge, gazing at your own reflection. What comes up for you? What presents itself for you? And then we talk about bird's legs, and I know bird legs, and I associate the bird legs with health. Now, oftentimes bird legs have had a negative connotation um, in terms of not being very, um, with stamina or describing someone that doesn't have attractive legs. And what I wanna say is despite their differences, the legs of birds all serve to provide strength and stamina. And we too can do the same. So, and with birds, the legs of birds offer them a lot of, um, what's the word, benefits. They, and, and, and take on a, a lot of different characteristics. They keep them buoyed on water. It helps them dabble through the ill grass, propels them through to forage for food, to clutch their prey. To, to shelter their eggs, to even moderate their, their body's temperatures, and to preen their feathers clean. So when you think about all the different ways that birds' feathers have offered them um, service, um, that's what I wanted to, to kind of symbolize through calling this chapter on health, that oftentimes some of us may appear to be in fine health or well, from outward appearance or the other way around it may seem like we're not in good health, but in fact, very um, sturdy and capable um, in the capacities that we have. Similarly with our health, I really wanted to emphasize 
the importance of these three common experiences that most of us are going to experience sometimes in our lives. And that is the quality of our well-being, chronic pain, and stress. I don't know anyone that's going to escape this life without at least one of these three, if not all, at some point. I'm Unfortunately, unfortunately, some level of stress is beneficial for us when it becomes debilitating and immobilizing and interferes with our other aspects of life. That's when it can be challenging and difficult. And so what do we do about that? So many of us are stressed with the worries of what's going on in the world, all aspects of it. I want to offer to you to think about how birds can be a part of your health, a part of your healing. And part of that is really to think about starting from where you're at. Too often we come from norms in society saying, unless everything's perfect, unless you're always happy, and unless you have, you walk a certain way and look a certain way in terms of health wise, you're not okay. And so we internalize those messages and it makes it even more difficult for us, especially those that have, who are with disabilities, who may have, have chronic pain, it's already debilitating, which then leads to mental health conditions that are even more so exacerbated quite often, often enough. And so birds do not have judgment. Birds accept you as you are, as we are. Now, sure, if you go out in the yard and you, your, your energy's energetic and they might take flight, they will return. That doesn't mean they're rejecting you. They're just responding to you. But at least there's this general knowledge of acceptance and well-being. And that's the message that connecting with birds can have for our health. Spending time in nature. Ideally, there's many studies that support that spending time listening to bird song like we're doing right now. And I'm going to pause for 30 seconds. Studies support that listening to bird song helps reduce feelings of sensations of pain, as well as mental health conditions, which we'll talk about in a, in a, couple, in a few minutes. Um, connecting with birds since the pandemic, more and more research has come forward about the direct correlation between the reduction of physical health symptoms and the connection with spending time with birds. You don't have to know the species, the name, it's the idea of spending time with them, either from inside looking out or out in their na natural environment. The greener, the bluer, the better. But spending time has been shown to help reduce stress, chronic conditions, improve your cognitive functioning, your ability to focus and attend to things, your quality of sleep, energy, even post-surgery and illness, and to boost your immune system. And a lot of that also correlates like where are birds? They're in their natural habitat, they're in trees, they're in shrubs, they're in green spaces on water. That's where it goes almost to our cellular level, if you will, to our ancestral and cellular level, the connection we have to being on the land and connected to natural space, being connected to the more than human world. Birds are a part of that and we are a part of that. And so, the more often we are immersed in that in, in those environments, it, it 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 sends a message to our parasympathetic and our system as well as just overall well-being that all is well. There's a sense of awe, a sense of just joy and happiness that is that occurs. And spending time with trees, as in forest bathing, the trees emit chemicals that also help to benefit in the same conditions as these are. So that's what the correlation is, and that's the benefit of spending time with birds on your physical health. In addition to if you go out put birding on outings, you're walking, you're, you're moving in a way that you can, if you use wheels, whether a stroller, wheelchair, or other um, 
um, supportive device, your movement helps with your well-being as well. If you do it with another person, that enhances your, your, your physical health. And then feathers. So feathers, I really like this chapter. Um, I then you might be wondering, like, well, what does feathers have to do with relationships? And yes, birds are evolved, are the and are the ancestors, dinosaurs are the ancestors to birds. True, 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 very true. And so that in and of itself helps to remind us of the long deep connection we have ancestrally to the more than human world, to birds and to ourselves and those who came before us as well. And I liken birds, I mean, I liken feathers to um, our relationships. And for those who may not know, the, the, the wing of a bird has several layers of feathers. There's primary feathers, secondary feathers, and then tertiary feathers. And similarly, we have relationships that are primary relationships, secondary relationships, and then tertiary relationships. And all of those relationships, depending on how we connect, who they are, how often we're connected to them, but collectively they create that wing, the relationship that helps us to lift and buoy above and, and help support us in life as we go along, um, as we go along. And I want to read with you a little passage from chapter five, which is feathers, page 77. If you're reading along. So this is feathers, bird watching and relationships. Snow still blanketed the iconic Colorado mountain ranges and poured into the valleys like sugar spilled from a bowl. Its sunlit crystal sparkled amid the regal pines as we drove east along the interstate. Ski lifts and ski slope paths marked with ribbon and brightly colored posts dotted through forest clearings, ending where they began at the lodges below. And then we both saw it, my husband and I, seeming to appear from nowhere, a very dark brown bird with an impressive wingspan soaring down from the skies facing us heading west. It descended low into the valley, stretching alongside the interstate and glided just above the river that rushed over glistening boulders and lost tree limbs. As it glided westward above the water and we drove eastward, slightly elevated, and eventually we could see its distinctive white head, yellow beak and magnificent brown wings stretch over nearly the entire width of the water. We had never witnessed such a glorious sight in person before. Almost instantaneously, we knew this was a gift from the universe on behalf of my dad, guiding us with lifted spirit onward to our journey in his commemorative honor. His favorite birds were eagles, and most especially the majestic American bald eagle, which he revered, which he valued, which he revered for its symbolism of freedom for his country. He valued it so much that he named his mountain cabin up in the Rockies the Eagle's Nest because eagles could be seen up there and it sat atop a valley that was free and full of big country sky, untarnished by city and lights. My dad, a steady anchor in my life, had defied his sense of permanence as a founding member of our family, always there, conservatively predictable and steady, and we were on our way this last time to prepare for his military memorial service in the coming days. Thank you, Dad. And this is my dad, who was a decorated naval officer for 31 years. Um, and a bird and a birder. He loved birds and his second or third career was as a park ranger. She loved being in nature and spending time in nature as well. And speaking of relationships, here are some of my family members, children, grandchildren, bonus children, 
enjoying spending time with birds in different ways. Consider who you might spend time with, with, with in your life as well. And sometimes we want to do that on our own. And then other times spending it with another. You don't have to always know all the birds to spend time out with another one, a, a, whether it's a young one or an older. To me, there's you're not too young or too old to spend time with birds and to notice birds. And keep looking up. Double entendre intend, in, in, intended. To go birding, you, a lot of times you're looking up. I don't know if you've seen birders before, if you're a birder yourself, where you can get cricked neck, especially in the springtime, if you're with, in warbler country, where there's lots of warblers migrating through, coming up from South America, for example, you strain to look up, 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 and that's called warbler's neck. It's a joke and funny, but it's true and it's pain. Sometimes it, it's, it's, a, it's a thing, it's real. But I also likened it to in mental health, how can we, time and time again, come back to a way of, while we're going to have ups and downs in life, because we're going to have it, what are ways to feel uplifted and to look up again, to consider again? And that's where the connecting with birds, similarly to health, has been shown to really offer us guidance, to take time, to slow down, and to benefit. In the book, I talk about three common mental health conditions that one in five adults experiences and one in six children, that's children 17 and younger, as young as five, um, experience depression, anxiety, grief, and loss. And as I say in the book, I am a mental health, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. And me being a mental health clinician did not inoculate me from these experiences. I developed the depression, anxiety, and the loss of what I used to have in terms of the style, my lifestyle of being very active to becoming immobilized and couch bound. And that depression became just the cyclic dark period. And it was that little yellow bird that helped to lift me, to offer me, um, a, a chance to notice that there was possibility. And I want to offer for you the same, that there is benefit from spending time with birds. To, and there's been research again with birds and in nature to reduce common symptoms of health and mental health and to increase your sense of feeling connected to others and mindfulness and compassion and to regulate your mood. Spending time with birds nearby, listening to bird song, whether you know or know the birds. And one study in particular talked about like if you spend two hours over the course of seven days out in nature, preferably in the afternoon, around birds, whether you know what they are or not, showed the highest benefit and improvement in your well being and reduced mental health, like depression and the sense of anxiety, lowered your sense of stress, really caused you to feel calm. So in the middle of the day and you're wondering, what should I do? If you step out for a few minutes, notice how you felt before doing so and how you felt after. And then finally, migration, which is travel. That's really what that is. It's about going further beyond your community, your neighborhood, what's familiar and exploring. And I like to suggest to plan to notice, to go see birds as when you go on travel, as well as be open to stumbling across new possibilities along the way. I talk about in the book, so I made sure to share, Cannon Beach, Oregon has puffins. And as a child, I wanted to see puffins. I thought I would have to go to Finland or somewhere far, but just so you know, and I know you're on the East Coast, so you have the Atlantic puffins. These are the tufted puffins, which are on the West and Northern in Oregon um, and in, in that region. And they come every year to this, what's called Haystack Rock. It's one of the largest monoliths in the country. Um, and 
it allowed me to have an extension of what I had been learning and experiencing in my nest at home, in my community with my flock, with the birding community that I started to build connection with. I then was able to take those tools, those practices and connections and expand it into travel when I would go out and about. And you don't have to go far. I don't want it to make you feel that you have to go on long distances. It's not that you can't, but I travel could be, you know, miles away from where you live, depending on where you are, that's travel. And just to take notice of what park, what preserve might be by, might, might be near you. And in the book, I really offered you some considerations on how to go about doing that. How to identify what might be in your neighborhood that you've never explored before that could feel like you're going on an adventure. So my last question for you is for the chat, what's a memorable trip with birds that you've dreamed of going to and why? Has anyone thought about a trip you're wanting to go on? Maybe it isn't considering birds, but is there a trip that you're, 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 you're wanting to go on or a trip that you went on and you happen to notice birds while on that trip? How did that, how does that memory inform you now? Johnson said that she went kayaking and saw one of her favorite birds, the roseate spoonbill in Florida. Awesome. Yeah, you, oh, and she would also like to see the puffins up north. I just went to Costa Rica not too long ago and saw the roseate spoonbills myself. Yes, the California condor. Thank you, thank you. So think about that when you're traveling or with, and again, you might say, oh, I wanna go, as Johnson's sharing, where, when you and then maybe again it's not connected to birds in the idea of where you would like to go but then tack on the idea of being open to noticing birds is what i'm trying to invite for you to to richen and deepen that oh and she saw the blue-footed booby in galapagos yay i have not seen it that's very cool and Debbie said, we used to go to Maine every summer and there were cruises to a small island that had puffins. Unfortunately, every time we went on that cruise, we just missed them by a day or so. I still hope to see them someday. Yes. Sometimes we call that nemesis birds, right? The bird that just, that got away. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, thank you. Exploring new lands and the birds that inhabit them nourishes our soul. And the final chapter, bird watching for life. For life, for living. Much of what we do, you'll find that there's a lot of what we do that's around ritual, about revisiting places that we've traveled, about um, traditions and practices we have based on who we are, who we're connected with. And similarly, birds have rituals too, often around mating, where they return to each year, like the picture of the haystack there in Cannon um, Beach. The puffins stay out to sea all through the year, except from April until about early September when they come and nest on that haystack high up and have one puffling, and that is what they're called, a puffling. Um, and they do that each year they return. And there's birds, as you know, that do that as a ritual. And so, Part of what I want to invite for you to consider is how might coming full circle and revisiting a practice of birding helps to enrich your life. And maybe it's a special tree where you live that you can go and sit under or notice over time, return to it time and time again. It will offer you the appreciation of the change in seasons, what it offers, what does and doesn't live in it given the time of year, for example. Or perhaps there's a, a spot that you like to go to near where you live, as well as a distance away. Maybe it's a trip you always take each time. Where is the enrichment that you can connect with, with the more than human world and with yourself and with the birds? 
And there's lots of resources in the book as well as on my website. I want to thank you for spending time. I can be reached at tamawatts.com, connect at tamawatts. Um, the book is available. I'm going to stop sharing. The book is available as a audiobook where I narrate it, um, ebook, and good old handheld with A House Publisher. And Opening to, I see that there's some Q and A. And Lisa said, I love beaches because of the bird life. And Jolson said, birding just slows everything down and you become in awe of the natural world. Yes. We, we also had someone write in before, would you suggest some ideas for ch getting children involved in birding? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Yes. And my suggestion is to share with them your curiosity about what you're seeing um, and to engage, and I, what, so here's what I do. Like I have a, grand, a granddaughter that I started doing this with, with a lot of intention when she was around nine, 10 years of age, and now she's 20. Um, I would get the guidebook out and we'd go birding and then I would sit and say, okay, what birds did we see and make it an enjoyable experience, almost like super sleuthing. Um, and, then, and then I would sit from inside and notice the birds, like a hummingbird, and then just talk out loud about what it is you're seeing. Like, oh, I wonder, is that an Anna's hummingbird? Is that a Costa's hummingbird? Is that a hummingbird? Well, hummingbirds, and so it becomes more of an engagement out of curiosity rather than we must go. And then over time, taking them to nature centers and then noticing and pointing out the birds. So it's just a gradual introduction and invitation to notice birds as you go along. Now that, are, you know, I'm driving somewhere and I'll go, is what is the hawk up on the light post or what have you? Um, and then there's bird festivals, depending on where you, there's usually some bird festivals across the country um, that have a family day. So that's another fun way to engage with an activity. Um, a lot of nature centers have billboards and information that have bird information. So it's just gradually infusing the information about birds in all kinds of different ways. Cornell Lab of Ornithology, Audubon, um, those are two in particular that have a lot of information that's specific to children. And some of the um, chapters, Audubon chapters, for example, offer programming for preschoolers all the way up through high school. So depending on their needs and ages, they can do volunteerism. And so part of it is how we approach birding. We, we truly do exemplify for the, the, our children what's possible for them. And so if we're enjoying it and being relaxed about it and not being stressed, and if we don't know, we're just like, oh, well, I don't know what bird that is. Well, we'll figure it out some of these days. It, it doesn't have attachment, anything that's negative. So they'll come back to it again and again. Okay. Yes. How do you grapple with climate change and the negative things that are happening in nature when you are in nature and birding? Sometimes it can be depressing. Thank you for that. And yes, it can be, I think, to answer in short, acknowledging how you're feeling and that it is depressing and that there have been significant changes and that it is having a negative impact on you is the first step rather than feeling like I shouldn't have, I shouldn't be feeling this way. You have good cause and reason for the way you're feeling. And so it's validating those feelings for yourself. And that allows there to be the space to then breathe a bit and say, and then consider how do I acknowledge that as well as acknowledge what is right with all that's going on in the life? Because in the midst of what might, that is depressing and frightening, there is still joy and awe to be had. And so participating in that aspect while acknowledging the other is what helps navigate through all of this. In addition, 
like myself, I'm a volunteer. I volunteer on Audubon California, the board uh, board of directors, as the as a chapter rep for local chapter Audubon chapters in Southern California. I am also volunteering on Project Feeder Watch. I participate in in community science, conservation science, and that could be from my home, putting in data. Um, depending on where you are, there's opportunities through Cornell, through actually the New York Times is running a project right now where you can observe birds and put in the data. So you're you're contributing back to the environment. You're, you're offering a part of yourself. And we can't all show up in the same ways, but our little bit adds up. And so don't think that not doing anything or something doesn't matter because it does. There's a concept through um, Ray Brown's um, Talking Birds Bird Show which I recommend, called plurting, which is picking up trash as you are birding. Now imagine having kids around you doing the same. Again, not stressful, but you're contributing. So that gives yourself a sense of well-being, like you're doing something. You know, there's a lot of opportunities for volunteerism in all aspects uh, based on your talents and your skills, all ages, identities, et cetera. So I really encourage that. Another question came in. What are some of the more exciting birds you see in San Diego? Oh, thank you for that question. Not to brag, but <laughs> San Diego has most of the species of birds that come through. We're on the border. And so we have lagoons that are situated in, in San Diego County. So we get 583 species of birds. There's like 875, wow. I think, that come through the Pacific Flyway going north. So we get a lot, a lot of the birds. So I don't even know where to start. Like we just we have a lot. We have a lot of the birds. We're very fortunate. We have a lot of different geographical. If anyone's been to San Diego, we have the mountains, we have the desert, the ocean, um, the inland region. So we really do get a variety of birds in this area. We're very fortunate. San Diego Bird Festival every February. Oh, fun. Yep. Do you keep a journal of the birds you see? I do. Like I right now I'm I have one from Costa Rica that I'm still working on. That was just amazing. And so I do. I do. And I and I I I'm what you call like a I mix the type of birding I do. There's every day I bird and by that I bird at home. I wake up listening to the birds. I do my meditation with the birds outside early in the morning before the sun rises. I notice those birds and then I also keep a list of birds like a life list of birds I've seen. Um, some days I don't do that. I just notice the birds and I carry on. I'll be in the shopping center, going to the movie, look in the trees, look in the bushes. You might be surprised at some of the species you'll see and just get that little moment of joy before going into a medical appointment. Like I had, uh, my eyes are giving me trouble. I went today and took a few minutes and just listened for the birds and keep going. So. All, I, I bird in all kinds of ways. And I also do meditative mindfulness birding, which is not even using binoculars or scopes. It's just about being in nature, spending time noticing the birds and being in the present. You had another and, question come in. And then there is birding and kayaking, by the way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Connecticut just passed the lights out law in respect to migrating birds. Does California do that as well? California is also working on that. That is a national campaign that is really being moved forward. Millions and millions of birds, that's not an exaggeration, die every year because of light pollution. It throws them off their trajectory. They, they run into, they collide with the buildings and whatnot. So this is the Lights Out campaign across the country, across America, saying the Americas, Lights Out, turn off your porch lights, dim your lights, turn them down because we're in spring, we're in fall migration right now. So this is critical till the end of October that birds have their safe passage. We're trying to reduce that. And so educating the public about that, companies and corporations is very much across the country. And Audubon, Cornell, a lot of the bird organizations are collectively working together to do that. Sounds, sounds like a good idea for the birds and for energy. True, exactly. Yes. Well, we have come to the end of the hour. I want to show everyone your great book. So pretty. Let's see if I get it up there. And as I said, our independent bookstore, Barrett Books, has it on the shelf. 
and I encourage people to stop by and pick up a copy. And I can't thank you enough for this refreshing evening. I'm going to go out and see who's up in the sky tonight. Yes, that's a great, I'm glad you mentioned that at night too. Birds are always with us. They migrate over us at night. People don't realize that and they rest during the day, which is why you see them as well, we're going. Through. So I hope everyone enjoys their evening and the birds. Peace and Thank birds. you so much. Thank you. Thanks for spending time with us and um, we'll see you soon, I hope. Thanks, yes. Emma. Peace and birds. Bye, everyone. Good night.